Yep. Yeah. Steve, welcome well, to the uh, First of all, I apologize for being a little bit behind the switch. As I was getting ready to post one of the stories that's breaking on my website, guess what, Doug? My whole login, my whole everything disappeared. Really? And that's, you know, a lovely night to have that happen. But anyway, uh, tonight we're going to have a, an amazing show because L.A. and I are going to talk about the corresponding areas of our research. And obviously all of those of us who will be at Branson uh, September 15th through the 17th are pretty much original researchers going out in the field and traveling, uh, you know, to wherever we need to go and sending our film crews there. And I want to make a statement right out of the, the shoot that we're going to see now so many leaks in the dike that has held back the truth for so many literally millennia that as we come into the, I would say, the fullness of the biblical last days being uh, shown uh, in living color for us all, the idea is simply this, that the greatest cover-up and cover-over of history, they're coming a part of the seams. And so I believe that it will be God's initiative to reveal all of the hidden works of darkness, not the enemy using the hidden works of darkness to destroy God's people. And, you know, I want to deal with something right out of the, uh, the box on this, too. The reason this whole thing about giants is so important is because God guaranteed in Genesis that, uh, you know, basically the seed of man would conquer the seed of the serpent. But yet the devil has been trying all he could in all the times and machinations and all the power that was afforded him as one of the most powerful, if you will, archangels. And actually, he's more of a, a you know, an anointing cherub, according to Ezekiel 28. But the point is, is that these things are coming to pass right before our eyes. And as we were basically, uh, L.A. and I were together with Tim Alberino all the people that went with us on the conference. We had Anselm P. Rombla give us a blow-by-blow account of the places we were at. Uh, obviously, one of the world's lead explorers who uh, more than clued us in to the areas in Peru that are, interestingly enough, aligned up again with Orion, aligned up, uh, lined up excuse me, with Pleiades. And so what's happening is everyone's worried about, or not worried, but saying to me in my email, I'm sure you're getting at Doug L.A., I'll turn it over to you, L.A., in a second, the fact that, you know, what do you think of the alignment that's coming in September? What do you think of the eclipse that's coming the 21st? And I said, well, that's, that's good, and, you know, there are people that are smarter than I am on that stuff. But I'll say this, it will pale in comparison to what's coming up on the Earth, because you're going to have a synchronicity or a corresponding set of releases that are going to be in the heavens on earth and uh not only earthquakes but disruptions and if my emails and they're increasing uh panic now i'm talking about christians i know that no christian should panic we're promised in the word of god that basically uh you know god will deliver us from our fear if we obviously surrender to him but fear is coming upon the earth because jesus said Men's hearts failing them for fear for looking after those things coming upon the earth, and that's up on the earth. So as the volcanoes rage and as the earthquakes, you know, increase in intensity, and as the uh, lies of history, which have been promulgated to this point, continue on and on and on, it becomes really apparent that we are in a different world now than we ever would have thought we'd been, and everything is accelerating. So I'll turn it over to L.A. and L.A. when you're, you know, uh, tired or want to break, give it back to me. But <laughs> let me ask you this. What's, what's, what's the credit, or forgive me, not what's the credit, but what's the area of your expertise now where you, you're concentrating your efforts, having just gotten back from Peru, having obviously going to be one of the keynote speakers, True Legends Conference, Branson, Missouri, September 15th through the 17th. So tell me, where, where are you at right now? Because we haven't talked, Doug, so you know, since we both got back from Peru, I don't think we've talked. We've emailed a couple times, but go ahead, L.A. Well, Steve, first of all, happy birthday to you. And uh, Thank you. I think I'm a little older last time I checked, <laughs> I mean, like six months or a year or something. But, you know, anyway, I just hope you had a great birthday. But, you know, well, thank um, you. If, I, if I can, yeah, if I can weigh in here just for a second. It's amazing how the powers that be let stuff out or somebody blows it and lets stuff out. And what I'm talking about, and I, I, I sent it over um, it, it's in the chat, Doug, if, if you can, you know, it's on my Skype thing. I sent it over to you guys. But it's a picture. It was found on Ynet uh, a couple of days ago. 
And it's, it's a typical archaeological picture. There's a skeleton that they uncovered, and it seems to be a Canaanite, yada, yada, yada. They've got six fingers. Got six fingers. The skeleton, plain as day, just like I found on Catalina, it's got six fingers. Now, normally what happens, just like at Catalina Island, when I discovered that cache of records, um, it had already been picked through. Archaeologists, anthropologists, researchers had already gone in there. They had taken all these photographs. Everything was cataloged in Manila you know, with Gooden, Gooden Photos, Catalina, Gooden Photos, San Miguel. These are the Channel Islands right outside of uh, Los Angeles and the California coast. So everything was – it wasn't like I was opening up a trunk and examining everything. Well, that wasn't the case. Everything had been picked over. What amazed me is within two hours, I was finding anomalous, and I mean that, underline that, and italicize it, photographs that shouldn't be there. Elongated skulls, six fingers, the two skulls. Boy, hey, Doug, he's really we, cutting out on every see. other word. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, LA, um, LA. yeah. The uh, your your audio, you were just uh, the last paragraph there. We we probably heard every eighth or ninth word, so you may want to uh, repeat <laughs> repeat that. That's just so bizarre. I wonder why it's doing. Your connection that. sounds good. Oh. Your audio sounds good. Okay, maybe I'm banging on my desk too much. I should calm down here. Um, on, on Catalina Island, what we discovered were anomalous photographs. We discovered nine footers. We discovered elongated skulls. We discovered six fingers. All that's not supposed to be there. And all those photographs were hidden away, literally. Hidden away in museum boxes, never to see the light of day. When we published An Armor Trail of Anephiline 2, what has now gone viral, the Ralph Gooden photograph where he's standing in front of the giant, when we went back to the museum, it was redacted. In other words, cropped out of the picture. The picture was, was blown up, thrown up on the wall, and underneath the picture was on Ralph Gooden. Is my audio better? Yeah, or it, it, you just, you, yeah, it just blipped out just for a second, but just we, we the got the context. Sentence. Yeah, 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 we, we got it all. It's better. Very strange. Very strange. Yeah. Well, it's not very strange, L.A., because, again, I'm telling you, watching what's happening, and I'm going to see if uh, – do you guys have him? Because he's cutting out on me. I can't hear him. But just for the record, everything that we used to talk about at the beginning of the release, the information on giants, whether it was a Lovelock cave in Nevada, the red-haired yeah. mummies here, there, everything – it's in full-scale sanitation mode. But while they're trying to sanitize the old stuff, and while I would say the dead stuff, the skeletons, etc., the reports of live giants are coming in from around the world. And I'm talking about from everybody from missionaries. I'm talking about from businessmen. I'm talking about from naval uh, officers. I'm talking about from uh, Air Force officers in India who are sending me some amazing stuff in uh, some of the giant tombs dug and everything but here's the deal they can't keep it under control but every time it's you can count on it every time we bring up something they'll do their best to mess with it go ahead la yeah i i think it's uh it's exactly what you say you know you know i remember when you broke your story um on the on the giant and you, and you had the pilot on coast to coast and i just sat there with my jaw on the ground going you know you've got to be kidding me and a couple of years later um we got wind of this guy who said he was a shooter. And, you know, we covered this in our Watchers series. And then you and I talked about it, and we introduced the shooter and, and the pilot together. And this is what neither of us knew before we sort of teamed up on this thing. It's, it's two accounts, two different accounts. And since then, there was another guy that came up to me at a conference. And he was active military, so he couldn't come on the record. And he just told me point blank. And this happened in Iraq um, around 2005 or four, right around in there. Uh, when, and he told me he was dispatched to an area. The moment he landed, his security clearance went up to whatever, you know, top secret, whatever, whatever clearance he needed. He was immediately promoted, not only with security clearance, but he was promoted in rank. And, and he told me there was something on a crate which was covered up. And I said, well, he goes, it was biological. And I looked at him and I said, 
Was it a giant? And he just nodded his head yes like that. So, I mean, we know of three. And that's, to me, that's like really troubling. Because we don't know how many more are underneath the ground. And that's where they're from, in the tunnel complexes. Well, I think, too, that it's it's not only troubling, but it's also uh, a major point of contention because Dr. L.A.I., Tim Alberino, Tom Horn, uh, Dr. Michael Lake, uh, you know, uh, uh, Derek Gilbert, the speakers that are going to be at the conference, the one thing we come up against, people say, well, why, uh, why is this stuff even important? You guys should be talking about salvation. Well, we do talk about salvation. I just want to go on sure. record of stating, since people have uh, heard all of us talking about this, a lot of people are giving their hearts to the living God over the fact that the churches are basically, I can say this, they sound like chickens and they should be soaring like eagles. I'll leave off the other word at the end of chickens. But in <laughs> Second Samuel 21, 20, there you go. And there was yet a battle in Gath where there was a man of great stature that hand, had on every hand six fingers and on the, every foot six toes. Four and twenty, I'm sorry, four and twenty in number for twenty-four. And he also was born of the giant. So in the Word of God, it makes it clear that this is a separate group of people. I was fighting, and I'm sorry, I, I'd like to sanitize it, where the man said, well, I don't care what it says. Here's what I think, it being the Bible. But the point is, is that it's critical to understand that everything is about the... <coughs> I apologize, everybody. I got crud again. Uh, everything in the in the entire Old Testament has a central theme of the giants resisting the people of God. And everything now that's going on in the world of genetic engineering, transhumanism, all of the muted genesis taking place, all of the laboratory experience, uh, experiments uh, based on the experience of antiquity are taking place. They're combining animal and human DNA. People say, well, why is that important? It's important because you're going to deal with it. And I don't know about you, L.A., but my e email box is filling up with people, Christians, who are having supernatural encounters with very evil and malevolent beings. And when they stand their authority in Jesus, they go. But what we're saying tonight, everyone, is this stuff is real. And it's very, very important that you understand it. It's not something that, and, and you know, I, I can't even go into all the arguments uh, against talking about this stuff, but the main argument in talking for it is that there's nothing new under the sun. And the same entities that existed prior to the flood, the giants, the, the offspring of the fallen angels, and I want to make it clear, giants are the offspring of the fallen angels. Giants have a supernatural life force. It's not a bunch of big guys waiting for 2,000 right. years to jump in a time tunnel and come and play basketball and beat all the seven-footers <laughs> because they're twice the size. So, you know, the idea is simply this. It is the Rosetta Stone of history. God absolutely spells it out. It's a law of first mention. In the rest of the Old Testament, they're called Rephaim, from the Hebrew word Rapha, which means dead. Now, it's funny, L.A., I won't tell you who, but somebody who is no fan of yours or mine, if people can guess. Look, I'm not into putting people down. Obviously, they like to put me down, but I won't put them down by name but by concept went on the biggest uh, show, Coast to Coast, and made a statement that there was nobody taller than seven feet. Well, I yeah. just so happened to send this guy, uh, or send uh, uh, Coast to Coast George Norrie, a picture of a guy that was eight feet tall. That's a contemporary guy in, in modern day, and he descends from the Giants. His friend has six fingers, six toes. And that's coming, that'll be Doug revealed. So what we're going to do, and yeah, L.A. That was a picture, stuff. We've, Steve, that was a picture yeah, you sent me, right? The, 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 yeah. Was, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, so, you saw how tall he was? Yeah, I, I did. And, and yeah. Yeah, there was no CGI or, or I mean, that that was a no. bona fide picture. Okay, go ahead, sir. Right, and it came to me in real time, everyone, from halfway around the world. I'm going to be kind of cautious here because i got to tell you something funny. When we did, and, and L.A., we're being watched, you and I, we're being watched by the people. You've probably been on the History Channel and A&E and some of the programs and stuff. But let me tell you this. Uh, we're being watched, and the minute we watch them, they, you know, it's interesting because they're going to people like Tom Horn, uh, Cliff Mahooty, the gentleman, the uh, Zuni elder, and they're 
basically following in our footsteps, but they're going to try and put their spin on it, okay? And we all know what the spin is. It's the alien spin. Yeah. So, again, the idea, and, and I'll turn it right now to L.A., the idea is, and this is a, a warning to those of you who are original researchers, be careful of phone calls that want referrals, because what they're doing is they're going to tie and take the narrative away from us. Go ahead, L.A. Well, you know, absolutely. You know, our research down in Paracas with the, with the DNA, which, by the way, is ongoing, and right now, and I, I don't mind saying this, but we've got about 31 samples at two different labs and, and they're being, we've done extractions, we're looking for haplogroups and those results will be forthcoming as soon as I get them. It, it'll be, uh, you know, we'll make a formal announcement and talk about it. And we might even do some peer review papers, but interestingly enough, the same character that you're talking about, Steve, also um, went out, out of his way to find a, uh, a Darwinist who was also basically a geneticist who looked at our, our DNA work that we did down in Paracas and disparaged it. Well, Mondo Gonzalez, who's our head archaeologist down there, he's an American citizen, but he, we, we employed him, and he comes with us down to Peru. We did the extractions, and we, we, were abs we have it all on film. We haven't released that film yet. It's all on film. We did the extractions um, to the T, exactly the way we're supposed to do it, um, as instructed by the Paleo DNA Lab, which is up in Canada. And what's amazing, this woman writes a kit piece, and this, you know, this guy that was on Coast to Coast, I won't mention his name either, um, goes out of his way to disparage not only your work, but my work. But no one ever contacted me, which, of course, is the biblical mandate. If you've got something against your brother, you know, why not, why not come to me and say, hey, L.A., what about this DNA? And I can tell you and I can show you. Uh, from, from different labs, that the haplo groups, first of all, um, are Middle Eastern and European. That rewrites history, if it holds. So far, we've got uh, six samples that, that are European or Middle Eastern ancestry, which goes against the Darwinian paradigm. Now, of course, this woman is saying, oh, it's all contaminated. Oh, it's all contaminated. Well, that's easy to say from her point of view. It's very easy to say, well, it was all contaminated. But how does she know? It was contaminated. And why do we keep getting the same results over and over and over again? And so it was just a blatant hit piece. And, of course, Mondo Gonzalez wrote this very, very fair rebuttal, which I posted. And it's been crickets ever since. It makes me wonder why someone like this would go on coast to coast and insist that there's nothing over seven feet. And yet I've got photographic proof of just under nine feet out on Catalina Island. And this is exactly what Glidden said. This is why I went out there and I tracked it down because I got wind of a story that was published in the Los Angeles Times where Glidden talked about a race of giants that he was beginning to uncover out on Catalina. And it made the front page of the LA Times circa 1919 and 1921. And by going out to Catalina, and which took, by the way, six months to, get at, to gain access to the archives, but when I got out there, there were the photographs. You know, and, you know, you say not only the, the giant skeleton, but the elongated skulls, the six fingers are there. And, you, you know, you can't, people go, oh, it's cradle headboard in L.A. Look, the more, and, and again, this, this one particular guy will tell us everything's cradle headboarded, nothing to see here. With all due respect, this gentleman, I use the term somewhat loosely, um, he has never handled one of these, to the best of my knowledge. I've handled multiple uh, skulls and not cast. I mean, the real deal. I've been, to, I've been to numerous museums. I've had access to things. What we've discovered is the morphology, and I'll be talking about this, by the way, at Branson. This is part of what, what I'll be discussing at Branson. And that, you know, folks, it, I think it's sold out or close to it. So uh, live streaming is the thing to get at this point. And yeah, it, 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 yeah, let me interrupt you. It is sold out, so live streaming is the only way to get it. And, again, L.A., you're going to break stuff. We're going to break stuff. And Anson P. Ramla, who's held on to some of his discoveries for 40 years, I find it interesting because all of us are going to be there. And then people can use their God-given ability to pray, their God-given ability and knowledge of the Word of God. But when I get – and when I hear – now, look, let me say this. 
this. I'm not a nice person, okay? I'll say it so you don't have to send me this and say that, yeah, I'm not a nice person. I admit that. But at least I want to have the intellectual honesty to basically uh, deal with facts and not pull on some hellish Darwinist uh, in a Christian argument to dispute a Christian brother. First of all, let me say this. In defense of L.A., my work, Tim's work, others' work, when we go digging up, and literally the case, not just old bones, but old records from the conquistadors that knew right. how to measure stuff, and skulls are 42 inches from the eye socket to the back of the head, when there are over 12 or records, forgive me, of stuff that is uh, uh, on the, uh, what would you say, on the radar and on the scenario of everyone else, then you can go and see it. It bothers me. It bothers me that people are that stupid to say, well, there's nothing over nine feet. I will make a statement right now that will probably astonish everybody. But the, the idea that there are people in the U.S. military and special operations of branches that everyone is known not to exist, in other words, there's no records, even to the point of, uh, you know, uh, finger um, fingerprints and other identifying marks being manipulated in such an extent that even if you had palm prints or anything, you couldn't tell that these were the original people. But when they tell me that they're battling the same things, L.A., that your guys told you that Al, you know, that uh, all over, uh, uh, all over the, uh, uh, what would you say, all over the military, I'm sorry, I got so much to say in a short time, that there are so many uh, eyewitnesses to this that it now is coming to the point in the mouth of two or three thousand witnesses, let every word be established. So let Ladies and gentlemen, you may not believe the 18, 1880s or the uh, 1909s or whatever the reports of the Kincaid expedition, but you were told that, and we were told by an insider, 174 million artifacts that are historically out of place or scientifically out of place are stored in the warehouses under the Smithsonian's care. And just to prove this, and I'll give it right back to L.A., I'm excited about this. I've been fighting with the uh, 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 pimples waiting to pop. That's a pretty gross description of some people that don't believe anything about the Giants, and they make sure that their opinions are all over the Internet. Finally, finally, there are some people in Australia and New Zealand that have done a marvelous tracking of Maui. Maui is one of the islands, obviously, in the Hawaiian Island change, but they don't understand that that was also an Egyptian seafarer that basically there's so much evidence now it can't be denied, that sailed the entire Pacific, sailed the entire Pacific. The gods of Egypt were in there and everything. Now, fast forward to the late, um, oh, the late 1880s, and uh, one of the guys who was an Egyptian uh, prime minister, he asked the Smithsonian, he asked U.S. government to return all Egyptian artifacts that were in the United States or to destroy them. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like basically... An Egyptian parliamentarian or, parliamentarian or, you know, the prime minister basically wanted everything covered up or brought back under his control. So what I'm saying is this, ladies and gentlemen, when I hear, and I, I'm saying this, when I hear someone make a dumbass statement like there's nobody over seven feet tall, well, then he better just give it up and forget basketball because the point being is that thousands of records testify against him. Every myth and legend testifies against him. Every single newspaper article, every single fine, people that have spent 50 years of their lives on the opposite side of the world tracking. This. So again, somebody says, well, you sound like you're a little irritated. Oh, yeah. But it's beyond irritation. It's beyond the fact that why would someone claiming to be, quote, a believer attack when he can't attack on the basis of fact, but just make, you know, uh, uh, stupid statements, but he can't back it up on history. If we write books, if we talk to the Native American elders, if, if L.A. goes to Peru, he deals with, uh, with all the Paracas skulls. And by the way, that's not head binding. Why do you think the Egyptians, who didn't practice head binding, head bound? How do you think blonde-haired, blue-eyed people got to Peru uh, in the Chachapoyo region? How do you think those blonde-haired, blue-eyed people ended up in the South Pacific, how do you think all this stuff spread? It wasn't because of isolationism. It was because right. of diffusionism. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah you know, that, th those two words, isolationism, diffusionism, we need to just break off for a second and talk about it. The Darwinists believe in isolationism. That's the prevailing paradigm all through archaeology, 
all through uh, the Darwinian scientific community. That's what they believe, that people are basically isolated. They really don't move around. They just kind of stay there, and things move very, very, very slowly. I'm a diffusionist. I know Stephen is. There's a whole bunch of us out there, and the diffusionist believes, no, people want to travel. People go, well, what the heck's over that hill? I don't know. Let's go. Okay, let's back a lunch and go. And that's what we believe happened. We know, look, I'll tell you something, Steve. It's really interesting. Um, the isolationists insist that America's Stonehenge uh, didn't exist, that the Phoenicians weren't there, yada, yada, yada. And yet, and yet, when we go to America's Stonehenge, which I've been to, and, I, and it's actually when, uh, all that research is in one of the books plus a YouTube video, whatever. The bottom line is, and it hinges the circle, there are standing stones, sometimes 100 yards, sometimes 200 yards away from the center of the hinge. So when you stand there in the center of the hinge on the summer solstice, which is the longest day of the year, the sun comes up over that standing stone. Native Americans did not create sites like this, but it, wait, it gets better. And this is what's amazing. And this is the work of Kelsey Stone. He went on Google Earth and he drew a line from the center of America's Stonehenge, which is in New Hampshire, okay? Drew the line out to the summer standing stone to see where it would go. And he continued the line and continued it and further and further and further. And he wound up in England, but he wound up in Stonehenge, England. And that line bisected perfectly the center trilithon, which is three stones, two uprights and a column on the top, creating like a, a, um, a bar up on top, a, a doorway, essentially. And that's impossible. And it's not a coincidence. And when he continues the line further because of the curvature of the earth, all you flat earthers out there, you wind up in Beirut, Lebanon. Beirut, Lebanon was one of the homes of the Phoenicians. It's diffusionism. They traveled. And that site was abandoned. And then you move over slightly just to another place where I've been numerous times, a great circle mound in Ohio, which when you stand there, the first thing that hits you is, my gosh, how did they do this? There, it's a hinge. There's a moat on the interior, a waterway on the interior, which goes down about eight feet below the surface. The entire area is dead flat. Why? Because the moat won't work or the, the hinge part, the waterway inside the hinge will not work unless the area is flat. That begs the question, how do ancient Americans in the Stone Age, because there are no iron tools pre-Columbian, how did they do that? There are no transits. How did they do that? There are no levels. How did they do that? Yet it's there. And originally there were two serpent heads at the entrance to this thing. It's a highly charged place. They found evidence of human sacrifice. Surprise, surprise. And what's amazing is originally when the white man came into the area, they asked the Native Americans who built this. And the Native Americans, and this is on record, stated, we don't know. It was here when we got here. And that goes back to, I call it Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology. Because in my opinion, that all these sites, you can only really appreciate them from the air. And who is the prince of the power of the air? Uh, Satan, Satan, the fallen cherub. For the record, I just want to be clear. You're referencing Newark Earthworks, correct? And, you know, one question I had lingering, because I visited the uh, visited that uh, w- with you, as a matter of fact, um, and, and this might have nothing to do with This might have not have anything to do with anything. The fact that there were strawberries there planted around that, 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 that ring, does that have anything to do with anything? Or is that just circumstantial? And, Doug, say that again. The fact that there were what around the Stra- ring? Strawberries. Uh, you know, the, the, the strawberries there forever. Strawberry plants. I know that sounds like an odd question to ask, but. Uh, good question. Well, hey, hey, Doug, I can't resist. Maybe that's what the Beatles were talking about. Strawberry fields forever. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I'll let it just Oh, you know. man. Well, it, 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 you know, coming out of my mouth, that question seemed a little bit odd. However, I had to ask that question because that's been bugging me for like two years. I just because it, it, it almost seems like everywhere I go or everywhere I look with respect to these mounds, there are strawberries. And maybe it's just like the area. I don't know. But help me out. Interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. 
Okay. Well, hey, Doug, are we taking a break or are we going through it? No, go go through it. Uh, you, your words are okay. valuable. Network has agreed to, to bypass a break, so go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank all of the sponsors, too. Here's, here's where we're at, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Rosetta Stone, which was found by Champollion that gave the ability to translate hieroglyphics into Greek and Dodatic, you know, which is kind of a, I think it's a Syrian language, D-O-D-E-T-I-C. There are so many stones now. You know, what's interesting about the witness, um, excuse me, <laughs> and we got smoke in the air in Montana, and it's just pollen central. We've got so many witnesses in the stars and in the monuments of stone. And for the record, fake news didn't exist then. The idea was simply that they recorded what they saw. They tried to explain it, but the advanced technology of all of the positioning of the megaliths, the monoliths, the cyclopean architecture, the Nephilim architecture, the map genius of it all, it did not come out of a pond, and it did not come out of uh, people crossing the land bridge into uh, from Eurasia into the uh, you know the North American South American continent. What it is is it's a testimony to the fact they they this is the I think this is the point we got to get across. La the official, if you will, a subversion of truth. They're going to use all of these everything we've been talking about. Tom Horn's been writing about. We've all been talking talking about, writing about, making videos about, it's all going to be used by the globalists, the luminists, the Satanists, the Luciferians to present a total different history than the Bible. And what's critical to understanding this, the one thing the devil hates more than anything is the Word of God, the Holy Bible. It is now Google's, uh, they're going to have a committee to determine what is no longer going to be allowed to be placed on the Internet. And I don't know if you saw that, L.A., but let me just share this. If it's perverse, twisted, uh, sick, disgusting, it's okay. If it's righteous, redemptive, moral, and has anything to do with the Bible, it will not be allowed. And uh, I think Susan Duclo is writing an article, maybe she's already written it, but the point is we're there now in time where we're trying to teach people, and one of the things that Branson, I want to make this clear, Branson's going to present, by the grace of God, a start-to-finish understanding of all this stuff. Uh, and it's really, excuse me again, boy, a tough night. It's really imperative that people see it. Now, they can't attend. It is sold out, totally sold out, but they can live stream. I I would encourage those of you to understand that not only we're we just presenting all this cool old stuff, but, uh, you know, Henry Gruber is going to be there, and he's a statesman in the kingdom of God. David Langford's going to be preaching on Sunday, and it, we don't have, listen, most of us don't have what it takes to, to go through what we're going to be going through in the coming period of time. I don't know if it's years, I don't know if it's months, I don't know if it's five years, I don't know that. The point is, though, is I know this, that by the way this thing came together in record time, by the way, I'm talking about the Branson, Missouri, by the way everything lined up, L.A. was able to go to uh, Peru, we were able to get some, met, meet some amazing people, you know, down there, but the way it all lined up and stacked up right now, and then September is the conference. I see God doing a thing. He's shortening the time and his people. And those of you that can't attend, you you won't lack anything outside of, you know, uh, you know, a bunch of people being there because obviously a lot of people like to be conferences. I'm not short selling it, but I'm just saying this. We've gone to a lot of expense to make sure everybody's got a front row seat in the live streaming. Uh, the guys that are setting all this up are professionals. So you can go, you know, again to the conference page, Gen, Gen 6, what is it? Gen6conferences.com. Uh, let me make sure of that. I've got so many websites, Doug, I can't even keep them straight anymore. No, you got that. You got that one right. Yeah, Gen Six Conference. Yeah, but but the point. Yeah, but the point is, is that they need to absolutely um, get signed up for live stream, and we have to buy buy it in blocks of a thousand. And so if we go over that, and there's not, uh, you know, we're we're going to be stuck at certain numbers. So it's Gen Six Conferences dot com, and you can go on the the middle banner, True Legend Streaming. Now people said, now get this, we were telling people on your show, we broke the story about the conference, and they said, well, I didn't think that, you know, I could, I would have to hurry. And I said, well, 
I can't tell you the timing, but I know this. If God's speeding up the time, then you probably should speed up your response to the events that you're already noticing in time. So the idea simply is this, that we're going to uh, present, I believe, the most cutting edge and up-to-date research. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not just talking about all this old stuff. We're talking about there's nothing new under the sun. If you don't think genetic engineering is going to affect you, think again. If you don't think robotic sex bots are going to affect you or your children's future, think again. That doesn't mean you're going to utilize uh, their uh, uh, machine intelligence or other parts of the robot. But the point is, is that people don't get it, Doug. Everything that God made is being attacked. And it's being, if you will, perverted. The Old Testament word is corrupt. And we have corrupted our ways. So I'm hoping people understand this. So when we're talking, look, we get pot shots taken us at all the time. And I get emails, and I'm sure you did too, L.A. What do you think about what so-and-so is saying? Well, he can speak Hebrew. Big deal. Uh, so could, uh, uh, you know, what, Belshazzar, and, uh, Belshazzar on the wall, and uh, he couldn't uh, read until it was interpreted by Daniel that his kingdom was about to be lost. I believe God has written the equivalent by the hand of God in the skies. Go look at my website today, and a picture a person submitted is uh, literally, it looks like war coming in the clouds, a guy with an M16 rifle. It looks like, and a tank in the background. Somebody says, oh, you're just seeing what you want to see. I said, it's interesting. At least it's coming from the west to the east. And that hit, that matches Henry Groover's vision. So getting back on track, the whole attempt to, to divorce humanity from the biblical truth, the whole attempt to control the narrative is to basically bring in not the Hegelian dialectic, but I would call it this, the Luciferian ultimate plan. You know, it is designed to bring us to that point where everything we used to know was true is now questioned. So they, they, keeping a person in a perpetual state of flux, that's what the, their side wants. I believe what God's going to give to all those who are attending and, and uh, you know, who will see the DVDs, who have ordered the DVDs, is a sense of understanding that we are now in the time of the end that Daniel spoke of, that knowledge would run to and fro, but it's being unsealed. And it's interesting, as the knowledge becomes unsealed in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation, it's Jesus who is worthy to break open the seal. To break open the seal.